Dr. Juan Abraldes, Associate Professor at the University of Alberta, presents this module that is part of the cirrhosis unit of the Fundamentals of Liver Disease. The title of this module is Current Management of Portal Hypertension and Versio Bleeding. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to click on the button Ask the Forum, where common issues regarding liver diseases are discussed. I have nothing to disclose, and in the presentation I will discuss the off-label use of propanolol, nadolol, and carbedilol for the prevention of variceal bleeding, and the off-label use of octreotide for acute variceal bleeding. The learning objectives in this module are to understand the rationale for the treatment of portal hypertension and viruses and to recognize the first-line therapies used to prevent the first variceal hemorrhage, to control acute variceal hemorrhage, and to prevent recurrent variceal hemorrhage. I will start by briefly reviewing the pathophysiology of portal hypertension. In lipocirrhosis, portal hypertension is initiated by an increasing hepatic resistance. But once an initial increase in portal hypertension occurs, this activates a series of events at the splenic and systemic circulation, characterized by splenic vasodilation, hypotension, effective hypovolemia. This activates the neurohumeral systems, leading to sodium and water retention, hypovolemia, increasing cardiac output, and this increase in cardiac output together with splenic vasodilation leads to an increase in blood flow that contributes to maintain and aggravate portal hypertension despite the development of portosystemic collaterals that decompress the system. Therefore, we can treat portal hypertension by decreasing blood inflow with vasoconstrictors such as beta blockers, which both decrease splenic vasodilation and decrease cardiac output, or vasoconstrictors such as octreotide. We can also decrease hepatic resistance with vasodilators, but the problem with vasodilators is that they also result in a decrease in uh, blood pressure that might result deleterious for the patient. A more dramatic way to decrease uh, hepatic resistance is to use a portosystemic shunt either a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt or a surgical shunt. And lastly, the endoscopic therapies complete the picture of treatment for portal hypertension by acting directly at the level of portosystemic collaterals. The most common collaterals are esophageal viruses, and the most endoscopic treatment for this is endoscopic bundle ligation. So how do we use these therapies in the clinical uh, practice? And we have three different clinical scenarios. The prevention of first variceal hemorrhage, and we will call these primary prophylaxis. The treatment of the acute variceal hemorrhage. And the prevention of recurrent hemorrhage or secondary prophylaxis. And we'll start with the prevention of first variceal bleeding. The first step in preventing variceal bleeding is to identify those patients that have viruses. In patients with compensated cirrhosis, the, uh, about 30% of them have viruses at the time of diagnosis, while patients with decompensated cirrhosis have viruses in about 60% of the cases. As a general rule, an upper endoscopy should be done in every patient after the diagnosis of cirrhosis and should be repeated at two to three year intervals in those patients that do not have viruses. However, in patients with compensated cirrhosis, the risk of finding high-risk viruses, those viruses that, as we will say afterwards, need treatment is very low in those that have both a liver stiffness measurement of less than 20 kilopascals and a normal platelet count. The approach to the prevention of variceal hemorrhage depends on the findings in the first endoscopy. If no viruses are found, the risk of uh, a variceal bleeding within one year is extremely low, around 2%. If viruses are small, this risk is around 5%, it is still low but it becomes much higher if we find large viruses, a 15% risk uh, 
of uh, baricial bidding at one year. So I will provide data of these three different clinical scenarios. In patients without viruses, there is a randomized trial with over 200 patients and very long follow-up over 10 years comparing the use of a non-selective beta blocker, in that case Timolol with placebo, for the prevention of the development of viruses. As you can see in this graph, Timolol was not more effective than placebo in preventing the development of viruses and it was associated with a higher rate of side effects. Therefore, there is no role for beta blockers in patients without viruses. In patients with small viruses, this randomized trial performed in Italy compared the use of nadolol with placebo in the prevention of the growth of viruses. This was a single blind trial, and as you can see in the plot, the use of nadolol was associated with a much lower progression to large viruses. And most importantly, the cumulative risk of bleeding was reduced by 50% if nadolol was initiated when viruses were small. These promising results, however, were not confirmed in another study by Dr. Calais performed in France. Still, the expert recommendation is to use beta blockers in patients with small viruses at high risk of bleeding. And these patients are those with uh, advanced liver disease, as defined by a child puke class C, or with endoscopic red signs at endoscopy, which suggest that uh, the viruses, even if they are small, they have a high risk of bleeding. Where there is no doubt that beta blockers are effective in preventing bleeding is in patients with medium or large viruses. And this is an individual patient meta-analysis published uh, in 1991 by Dr. Poinard showing that beta blockers reduced the risk of bleeding both in patients without ascites or with ascites or with good liver function defined as a child pew class of less than eight or less good liver function as defined as a child pew class of eight or more. Once started, beta blockers should be maintained indefinitely and no follow-up endoscopy is required. So how do we use beta blockers in these patients? Non-selective beta blockers that have been tested in the prevention of first bleeding are propanolol, and this drug is dosed twice a day with a maximum dose of 320 milligrams per day. Nadolol has the advantage of a once a day administration and the maximum dose is 160 milligrams, and carvedilol which is a non-selective beta blocker with also an alpha adrenergic blocker activity. Since carvedilol is more effective in decreasing arterial pressure, it could be the first choice if patients have systemic hypertension. The maximum dose in primary prophylaxis should be 12.5 milligrams per day. The dose of beta blockers should be individualized by titrating to the maximum tolerated dose provided that heart rate does not go below 55 beats per minute and systolic blood pressure does not decrease below 95 millimeters of mercury. Beta blockers are not ideal drugs. They cannot be used in around 30% of the patients. 15% of them have absolute of relative contraindications and another 15% have side effects leading to discontinuation. Also, the use of beta blockers is time consuming because they require titration. And the latest controversy is whether beta blockers may be dangerous in some patients, especially with end stage liver disease. And this was especially questioned in patients with refractory ascites. The controversy of the use of beta blockers in patients with advanced cirrhosis started with the publication of this study in 2010. This was a prospective observational study in patients with refractory ascites. 
Some of them were treated with beta blockers and some of them were not. Patients treated with beta blockers had a much shorter survival than patients not treated with beta blockers. So the conclusion of the study was that beta blockers could be dangerous in patients with refractory ascites. However, this was an observational study with all the inherent biases and confounding by indication. And several subsequent observational studies did not confirm these findings. The current consensus put forward by the American Association for the Study of the Liver Guidance in 2016 was that refractory ascites is not a contraindication for treatment with non-selective beta blockers. High doses of non-selective beta blockers, and this is more than 116 milligrams per, milligrams per day of propanolol, or more than 80 milligrams per day of nadolol, should be avoided. In patients with refractory ascites and severe circulatory dysfunction, identify as a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 millimeters of mercury, a serum sodium of less than 130, or the presence of hepatorenal syndrome, the dose of non-selective beta blockers should be decreased or the drug temporarily held, and medication can be reintroduced if circulatory dysfunction improves. What are the alternatives to beta blockers? And this is mainly endoscopic band and ligation, which consists, as shown in the picture, to put ra rubber bands around the viruses so they eventually thrombose and drop, leaving, leaving a scar in the esophagus. Beta blockers have been compared in 18 randomized trials with endoscopic band and ligation. As you can see in this slide, overall endoscopic band and ligation proved more effective than beta blockers in the prevention of first bleeding. But when we limit the analysis to high quality studies and we define that as patients and we define that as studies including over 100 patients that were published as full reports, there were no differences between endoscopic band and ligation and beta blockers. So likely both they are equally effective in preventing first bleeding. So, in summary, either beta blockers or endoscopic band and ligation should be used in the prevention of first pericial hemorrhage in patients with medium to large viruses. And the choice should be based on local resources and expertise, on patients' preferences, and on patients' characteristics. For example, those with low baseline arterial pressure, with refractory ascites, or with contraindications to beta blockers should preferably receive endoscopic band and ligation. We move now to the treatment of acute varicial hemorrhage when the primary prevention mm -hmm. fails. Mortality from acute varicial bleeding has greatly decreased in the last few years. It was over 40% in the 1980s and it has decreased to less than 20% in the cities from 2003. And this was mainly due to a decrease in mortality directly related to bleeding. So that now over 70% of uh, the deaths during acute pericial bleeding are not directly related to ongoing bleeding, but to complications such as bacterial infection, renal failure, and liver failure. So if we want to improve the prognosis of acute pericial bleeding, we have to protect the liver, protect the kidney, and prevent infections. This slide summarizes the management of acute pericial bleeding. Upon suspected pharyngeal bleeding, and this would be any upper GI bleeding in a patient with cirrhosis, we would start passive drugs in the US octreotide, and we will add antibiotics such as IBC prophylaxis or cest reaction and an effective volume restitution until we stabilize the patient and perform the diagnostic endoscopy. And if uh, variceal bleeding is confirmed, we will perform therapeutic endoscopy, preferably with endoscopic band and ligation. Prophylactic antibiotics are an essential part of the treatment of acute variceal bleeding. As you can see in this meta-analysis, evaluating the use of prophylactic antibiotics in acute variceal bleeding, they not only prevent infection, there is a dramatic reduction, in the risk of infection, but also improve mortality by over 10%. So prophylactic antibiotics should be used from admission in every patient with acute pharyngeal bleeding.
After therapeutic endoscopy is performed, if breathing is controlled, octrotite is maintained for two to five days, and the patient is started on secondary prophylaxis. If this initial treatment fails, the patient generally requires a transjugular intrahepatic portal systemic shunt with temporal balloon tamponade if required to maintain hemodynamic stability. And now we move to the last part of this module, which is the prevention of recurrent variceal bleeding. If these patients after a variceal bleeding are left untreated, the probability of rebleeding during the first year is 60%. So we have to start the patient on a treatment to prevent re-bleeding. And over the years, several treatments have been proposed to this, and the most effective one is the combination of bundle ligation and beta blockers, which is the current recommendation as initial therapy to prevent re-bleeding. The use of tips for secondary prophylaxis was comparing 11 randomized trials with endoscopic therapy. And as expected, this was much more effective in preventing re bleeding. However, it was associated with an increased risk of encephalopathy and with similar mortality. And on this basis, we reserve the use of tips for patients that fail the first line of therapy for preventing re bleeding, which is again the use of beta blockers and endoscopic bundle ligation. We briefly discuss the potential role of transjugular intrahepatic portal systemic shunt. This treatment consists on creating a communication between the hepatic vein and the portal vein that is maintained by putting a stent to maintain the patency of this communication. So, in summary, either non-selective beta blockers or endoscopic band ligation can be used for the primary prevention of variceal bleeding. In acute variceal bleeding, the treatment consists of antibiotics, endoscopic therapy, and vasoactive drugs. And after a variceal bleeding episode, the treatment of choice is the combination of beta blockers and serial bundle ligation, antivarician eradication. This is the choice as rescue therapy in failures of endoscopic and pharmacological therapy. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation and I invite you to access additional content on liberal learning on this topic or any other related topics at your leisure. Thank you.